In the 1950s, pharmaceutical companies promised a safe sleep aid. It was sold in pharmacies. Pregnant women took it and nine months later, they gave birth to babies without arms, without legs, without eyes. This is the story of thalidomide, one of the most tragic failures in medical history. We may never know the full truth, but some researchers believe that the story of thalidomide began not in the 1950s, but during World War II. Otto Ambrose, a German chemist, worked on chemical weapons for the Nazi regime. In Auschwitz, he used prisoners as human test subjects. After the war, he was convicted of crimes against humanity and sentenced to eight years in prison. In 1954, Ambrose was released early and soon joined the German pharmaceutical company Kami Grunenthal. Around the same time, the company filed a patent for a new molecule. Their research director, Heinrich Muchter, publicly claimed the discovery was purely accidental. However, some researchers believe the compound, which would later be called thalidomide, may have been synthesized by Ambrose a decade earlier, during his time at Auschwitz. When Grunenthal registered the drug, they claimed it had already undergone extensive testing on humans. But when and where those tests were conducted remains a mystery. Officially, thalidomide was introduced as an anxiolytic, a medication designed to reduce anxiety. Its originally intended purpose as an anticonvulsant failed, but researchers discovered it had a powerful sedative and sleep-inducing effect, with no signs of overdose or addiction. Grunenthal aggressively marketed the drug under dozens of brand names, Contragen, Sofenon, Distaval, and promoted it as completely safe, even for pregnant women. The advertising was seductive, a deep, natural sleep that lasts all night. In 1958, the company launched a new campaign claiming thalidomide helped relieve nausea, insomnia, and anxiety in early pregnancy. It was soon labeled the best drug for pregnant and breastfeeding women. What no one knew was that this wonder drug was carrying a silent, monstrous risk. In the spring of 1956, a Grunenthal laboratory employee gave the new drug to his pregnant wife. That December, she gave birth to a baby girl, born without ears. She would become the first known victim of thalidomide. At the time, no alarms were raised. Babies with birth defects had been born before, and this case didn't seem extraordinary. But within just a few years, the number of children born with phocomelia, a rare condition where limbs are severely underdeveloped or absent, surged dramatically. In 1959, doctors around the world begin noticing something strange. Babies are born with horrifying deformities, without arms and legs, with tiny or absent limbs, without ears, with impaired vision and hearing. The condition doesn't match anything known. At first, doctors suspect a virus, radiation, genetic mutation, but the cases keep multiplying. In Australia, obstetrician Dr. William McBride notices that nearly all mothers of deformed newborns had taken thalidomide during pregnancy. He publishes a letter in the Lancet. That letter becomes the first public alarm. In Germany, pediatrician Dr. Wittekind Lenz launches his own investigation. He confirms the drug's teratogenic effects. He travels across Germany, collects medical records, interviews families. The pattern is undeniable. Thalidomide causes these birth defects. Both doctors face pressure. Some colleagues dismiss their warnings. The pharmaceutical companies push back, but McBride and Lenz refuse to be silent. They save thousands of lives. Meanwhile, Kimi Grunenthal continues selling the drug. New babies with severe deformities are born every single day. In December 1961, under public pressure and mounting medical evidence, Kimi Grunenthal finally pulls thalidomide from the market. But it is far too late. More than 10,000 children have been born with severe birth defects. Thousands more are stillborn or die within weeks. Governments in the UK, Canada, Japan, and elsewhere conduct emergency reviews. The drug is pulled from shelves, but the damage is already done. Parents file lawsuits. The company faces millions in potential damages. But the worst consequence is this. Public trust in medicine is shattered. In the United States, the thalidomide was never approved because of one woman, Dr. Frances Kelsey, a reviewer at the FDA. From the start, Kelsey was suspicious of the data presented by the manufacturer. She insisted on further research, particularly regarding effects on pregnant women. For a year, the pharmaceutical company pushed for approval, but Kelsey stood her ground. Her refusal likely saved thousands of American children. She was later awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Her caution became a turning point in drug regulation. Kelsey would go on to oversee hundreds of drug approvals. Her legacy, science with conscience. The Thalidomide left behind more than statistics. It left real lives, real pain, and real courage. Terry Wiles, born in the UK without limbs, 
became a symbol of resilience. With the help of specially designed mobility devices, he lived an independent life, later driving his own custom-built car. He and his adoptive parents fought for the rights of thalidomide victims and raised awareness globally. Matt Fraser, a British actor and musician born with Focomelia due to thalidomide, became a prominent figure in disability rights and arts. He has used his platform to bring visibility to disabled performers and advocate for inclusion and justice. These individuals didn't just survive, they thrived. They became reminders of human strength and warnings of corporate negligence. The thalidomide tragedy changed the pharmaceutical world forever. After the disaster, governments introduced sweeping reforms mandatory animal and human testing before approval, strict bans on untested drugs for pregnant women, transparent reporting of side effects, regulatory agencies gained more power and oversight. In Germany, victims spent decades fighting for compensation. Some companies offered partial settlements. The German government only began regular payments to victims in 2009. Across the globe, thalidomide survivors had to fight for dignity, recognition, and justice. Paradoxically, thalidomide is now used again under extreme restrictions. It has shown efficacy in treating leprosy and multiple myeloma, a type of cancer. But its use comes with strict protocols, dispensed only under surveillance programs. Women of childbearing age must follow contraceptive guidelines. Patients are closely monitored by doctors. The same drug that brought so much suffering is now saving lives, but only under intense scrutiny. It's a moral paradox. How can something so harmful also heal? The answer lies not in the pill, but in how we use it, and whether we remember the price already paid.